Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. Do you see the holy face on my screen? Well, if you don't recognize her, her name is Mother Miriam. She is host of the Mother Miriam Live radio podcast. She, to me, was always the the, the next uh, Mother Angelica. And so many of you have heard of who Mother Angelica was. Well, I was surprised. The only reason I'm saying this is my own mom, forgive me for calling you out, mom, hadn't heard of Mother Miriam, though she'd heard of Mother Angelica. Mother Miriam's show is heard by, uh, goes out to over 40 million people through LifeSite News. And she is, if you haven't heard her, amazing. It's a breath of fresh air to hear someone who's just straight, direct, and speaks the truth of God. And Mother, I am sitting here already talking you up. And I haven't even fully welcomed you to the show, which I will do in a second. So Mother Miriam, thank you so much for coming on to Breakfast with Bacon. And Christine, thank you for having me. I'm I'm honored. I'm happy. I love your life. I love that you live for God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that is, there's no second to do anything else on this earth. So thanks so much. Yeah, God well, bless. like you, Mother, I would die for Jesus. If I had to shed my blood, I'd do it. I wouldn't like it, but I would do it, you know? Um, because dying for him sometimes is easier than living for him. That's true. I never heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but I know so many people say, I would die for him. We want to die for him. We want, but living for him moment by moment is, is the greater challenge. It is because there's a lot of evil going on right now, isn't there? For sure. So I'm going to talk to you today, um, all my viewers, I want you to know, I'm going to talk to Mother Miriam today about her testimony. She was not only not always wearing a habit, she was not a Christian. Um, Mother Miriam is a Jewish girl gone good, right? <laughs> Although Jewish girls are good anyway. <laughs> gone full. Gone full. I say the most Jewish thing, most, Jew Jewish th most Jewish thing that you can do is to be Catholic. Oh, Yes. Yes, well, we got our faith from you. And it is just amazing. You're right, because you have now received the fullness of the truth. And I'm going to ask you, That's right. uh, uh, actually, I'll just ask you now. I was going to ask you later, do you speak Hebrew? I did as a child, not fluently, but we could read and write. Um, I haven't kept it up. So outside of some prayers, I've lost most of it. My brother had to memorize half the Torah for that. So, so we did as children, but... I can hardly remember most of it now. Well, I think that is such a blessing. It's one of the things that's on my bucket list, though I don't know if I'll ever get to it. I do want to be able to you know, look at the original texts of the Bible and, and be able to see them for what they are. But if God doesn't grant that to me, I'm going to trust my Jewish brothers and sisters. So that that's awesome that you have read it. Too bad you weren't able to keep it up. But... Um, I'm going to talk about the, you are the foundress of, I don't want to mess this up. You're currently the foundress of the daughters of Mary, mother of Israel's hope. Is that correct? That's perfect. Uh, and I will give people your website later because you're also building a priory at beforehand. Well, I asked priory, you we're Benedictines. And so priory is the Benedictine word for convent. And I tell you, uh, Christine, um, we've just found, it's it's been a, quite a journey for us, but uh, we had been planning on building a monastery for years, a uh, priory that would become a monastery, um, but the world is so terrible. Things are getting, evil is spreading its blanket over the world, increasingly day by day, if not moment by moment. And to raise millions of dollars, and take several years to build a monastery. I can't bear the thought of it. I live to put my arms around the world. And so we found 86 acres of land. It was an event center with two huge structures. One of them I could put 30 women into without adding on to it. And the other one will be our chapel. And we have a commercial kitchen, everything we need. It doesn't look like a monastery. It's two big red metal buildings on 86 acres. We're going to move in. We're hoping to close this Friday. It's getting exciting. Mm. Move in, unpack, and get to work. That's what we want. You had quite some difficulties, not only in finding that piece of land, but finding a diocese, didn't you? We did. Um, if I take you back a bit, 
in 2008, I was a, um, I entered the church in 1995 and was, uh, did many things in the church, but for the last nine years, I was a full-time staff apologist with Catholic Answers. And I left Catholic Answers in 2008 to found this community. It was at the invitation of Cardinal Raymond Burke, who was then Archbishop of St. Louis. And it knew of my dream and invited me to St. Louis. I was in California to found this. So he was our first bishop. Yeah. And a month after we got to St. Louis, I'm just going to give you a very quick journey. A month after we got to St. Louis, Pope Benedict at the time called Archbishop Burke to come and head the apostolic signature in Rome. We didn't have a bishop. I had never been a religious before, so I took off for a year, canonical, cloistered year, with the visitation order in Massachusetts. When I got back, the new bishop... Um, had complaints from the Jewish community because our name, Mother of Israel's Hope, they said, is she coming to evangelize us? And we weren't. This is for Catholics, our, our desires to help restore God's design for the family. But he placated the Jewish community and put us out. Bishop uh, Slattery of Tulsa took us in. Absolutely beautiful. Made us a public association of the faithful um, in 2011. Everything was fine. But when he retired, the new bishop came in who hadn't heard of me or us, but there's a particular cardinal who told him to put us out. We're too Catholic. We're not vanilla enough. And so we wrote to tons of bishops. No one would take us when they spoke to the new bishop there. And um, finally, out of the blue, a bishop of Kansas called and invited us. So we were for a year and a half in Beloit, Kansas, but we were with a church. We love the Latin mass. Uh, a Reverend Opus order was fine, but this was not. The Eucharist was being uh, er handled irreverently. Six-year-olds were reading scripture. We couldn't. And Bishop Strickland called me out of the blue. A year ago, December, out of the blue. And most bishops didn't want me because of the radio program. Bishop Strickland wanted me because of the radio program because he is all about truth. And so am I, nothing else matters. So we got here in August and last August, we're here about 10 months and we've been living in two trailers uh, on lease land and looking for a place to be able to take in more sisters. We're only six now. We have three more entering and over 50 that have written to come in. We, we need places to put them. So um, we've just found this land. And uh, if I could tell you, it's um, we've got it for half of what may I, we got it for 1.4 million, which is half of what it's worth. They are ecstatic that a religious order wants to have it and will do good in that property because they put so much into it. All the furniture and everything they're giving us, it's tremendous. So we've been raising money left and right. We have 150,000 of 1.4 million left. We need it in three days because we're supposed to close on Friday and we need every bit of it. Um, I, I've, we don't owe a penny and I've never borrowed a penny and I won't, even if it's no interest. People have offered us, I won't do it. What we have is what we know God has allowed us to have and we won't go beyond that. So three days, 150,000, if God wants it, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He could trade a few in, it's okay. So here we are, and we left, uh, we had three women when we came because everyone had to leave. And uh, now we have six, again, three more entering and over 50 women I haven't even been able to get back to. So we're gonna move hopefully this coming week and uh, from Saturday on and be able to begin to take women in. So it's been a journey. Yeah. Put out of two diocese, we've been put out of, one, Three, two right? dioceses. St. Louis, Oklahoma. Uh, Saint Oklahoma. And, and Kansas, we weren't put out of. We okay, just, it was a very place of suffering. But um, um, so, and off one radio network because of the same bishop that put us out of Oklahoma. So let God do what he wants. Let him do what he wants. He's sovereign. Nothing, Christine, 
I believe this as I breathe. Nothing touches us, evil or good, that God doesn't allow. Whether he causes it or not doesn't matter. He allows it. And every single thing works together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. His providence uh, is my breath. Mother, I will make sure this show gets uploaded today um, because I may not have 150,000 viewers yet, but I know that God will make sure the right people watch that will be touched right now watching the screen to help these yeah, women. You're not helping just these nine plus 50. You are helping these women, all future sisters who want to join this and every single soul the lord has ordained each of them to touch to get to heaven so if any of you to get to heaven, to get to heaven that's the only reason we live and breathe that's is to live thing. forever right. in heaven with god happily that's and it. we need to do our job on this short journey of life even if we live to be 100 years it is nothing but the blink of an eye and every single penny we have that's cannot right. be taken with us i beg of you and this is what I usually do at the end of the show, but please, if the Holy Spirit, while you listen to the show today is touching your heart, if you even have $10 that you want to contribute, the Lord is going to touch all the people that need to, because you heard sister's faith. She isn't going to borrow. She doesn't need to borrow because her God owns every single dollar that exists on this planet. And we so don't presume, Christine, we don't presume that God will give us. We just, what, what he what wants, we want, what he doesn't want, we don't want. Oh, that's we don't presume. Let me say that we are 501c3, so we're tax deductible. And the way people can give, if I just might tell you that, is going to our website, motherofisraelshope.org, and click on donate. And again, you'll have a tax deductible letter in response. Or you can go there and click on the contact button and get our address in, um, in Texas. So either way, uh, directly or through our website, um, may I tell you something, Christine? I would love to. Um, um, not just for all the sisters who may join us. I've asked for a million sisters to walk the streets. Um, when I was 19 and Jewish, didn't know anything else. Two people in the world, Jewish and non-Jewish. That's all I knew. We never heard a bad thing. It's just that we grew up conservative and separate from the world. And when I was 19 and working in Manhattan on my own, the news came out that nuns had permission to shorten their habits to knee length. Now, I didn't even know the word habit, but I knew that these nuns were in the world to affect the world for God. And it was the middle of the miniskirt error. And I thought instead the world had affected them. I don't say that now because I don't know everything that happened. I didn't know anything Catholic. I didn't know about Vatican II. But what happened at 19 years old Something that felt like an electric bolt ripped through me and paralyzed me for just two seconds. It became my deep and immediate loss. I lost something that wasn't mine and I let it go. 26 years later, listening to a certain troublemaker by the name of Scott Hahn, <laughs> he said, I was listening to four hours because I was looking into the church. It was 1990. I only went to save Catholics. I had become an evangelical Protestant first to save Catholics. So I was listening to his tape. How could a Presbyterian minister have become Catholic? How could he have had a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus and then become Catholic? How insane can you get? But Scott said at the end of that four hours, he said his words, for the one who will look into the claims of the Catholic Church, 2,000 years of church history, the church fathers. To that one will come, he said, a holy shock and a glorious amazement to find out that what he had been fighting, moi, and trying to save people from was in fact the church Christ established 200 years, 2,000 years ago. What happened to me at 19, that electric bolt, went through me at that moment 26 years later. And never again, those two times, it was so strong, it paralyzed me again for two seconds. And I knew on the spot that if I did not look into the claims of the Catholic Church, the last thing I ever wanted to do, I would be turning from God. And that began a four and a half year agonizing journey to the Catholic Church. 
my best friend who knew I was on that journey, she said, she was an evangelical. She said, Roz, Rosalind Moss is my given name. She said, Roz, if you become Catholic, you're not going to be a nun, are you? And I said, I never thought of that. I said that we were sitting in the midst of a sizzler, huge salad place in California. And I said, Beth, I didn't think of that. But I said, can you see me walking through this restaurant in a black and white habit to the floor? Even if people think I'm a medieval wacko, they have to think of God. Whatever they think of God, they have to think of God. How this happened, we'd need three hours, Christine. But my heart is not just to have a million sisters before I die and 20 million after I die. Part of our charism is returning the hemline to the floor and the habit to the world. We walk through the streets. And I could write a book on what happens. It's so beautiful. But I've known that the family is God's design to build his kingdom. And therefore, the enemy's number one target to destroy. Our Lady of Fatima said that uh, final battle the final battle God. will be between God and that's Satan. It, marriage and for, mm -hmm. That's it, marriage and the family. I know that the family, so all this transgender, transgenders, transhumanism, gender ideology, so-called same-sex marriage, all of that has one aim, only to destroy the family. Can't destroy the church, but if you destroy the family, no vocations, so forth. My hope is to help restore, even if we stay six, to help restore God's design for the family, to teach the faith, to help the father be the head, the mother to be the heart, to not be afraid of their children, to not stop parenting, parenting, to not turn them over to the schools and to the world. That's our dream. And that's why we live. That's what we want to do. So if we get this acreage, we'll be able to have families come. We can teach them. We can do all of that. It's It's been a dream. I didn't know that about you. So I don't know if you know this about me and I think it's on my website, but I'm not sure. But do you know what my life's mission is? To save a million marriages. The family. To save a oh, million yeah. marriages. Okay. That exact number. Oh, and yeah. as the Lord's been working in me, it's actually been, I want to save a million souls through marriage. That's right. And so the fact that That's you want right. to bring in a million sisters, we kind of think small, don't we? You and I. I like that. It was Jesus, uh, James writes, you have not because you ask not. It's good. Right. So that, that was the first thing I thought about is that is amazing that God put that spirit in you like me. It's I've had people say to me before, sister, mother, sorry, um, that I don't say, care. Mother is a sister. Don't worry. Okay. Thank you. The ones that are like, if I could just say one soul, I know my life will have been worthwhile. A, yes, your life will have been worthwhile. But B, I don't want just one. God didn't put me on this earth to get just one. He gave me this mission to get more. And my hope is to get that million. And I am going to pray in union with you that you get those million sisters because I believe they will. I believe, especially after the illumination of conscience comes and the three days of darkness, that women will be flocking to the convent because what a greater yeah. marriage than to be married on this earth to the, the bridegroom of heaven. I mean- that's it. They will that's just it. want to fill that habit. Um, yeah, that's right. I just had a, a thought that just flew. It just flew. So that's okay. It'll come back. Um, I know how that happens. The teacher lesson, what greater than to have him? Oh, yeah. So when I, I told my eye doctor that I said, you got to take care of these eyes for 500 years. She said, 500 years. I said, I want to live for 500 years. She said, who's going to be around for you to talk to? And I said, everyone that doesn't know Jesus, I don't live for anything else. Every soul and every family. Family is the cell of society and the restoration of civilization. That's so funny. I, without marriage, there's no family. No, and that's where our missions are absolutely, absolutely in line. And I want to talk, the bulk of this talk will be about that and your testimony. But I had one quick question I wanted to ask you. What made Beth? say, you're not going to become a sister, are you? What Was there something in that conversation or was that out of the blue to be funny or sarcastic or? No, no. As a Protestant, I was full-time. I worked for an orphanage. I worked for a halfway house. I was full-time ministry in my evangelical church. I ran the Bible Institute at night. I taught. 
I was a jail chaplain for 10 years, women's jail. So my whole life was lived only for our Lord and people to know him. Um, the Catholic chaplain of jail tried to save me, but forget her. I tried to save her because she was Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and so my friend Beth knew that what am I going to do? What do women do when they're Catholic? And I guess that's none is the only thing she thought of. Wow. And I think there was well, some... However, I'll just, okay, go ahead. I will say this, that I could tell you a thousand stories, but I just remembered this and I haven't remembered it for a few years. When I was looking into the church, because Scott Hahn, his tapes kind of started me, I went to Defending the Faith Conference at Steubenville just to sit. And the 1,500 people, I didn't want to sit with them. I was alone. I was not Catholic. And I said, hey, yuck, I'm sitting among 1,500 Catholics. I sat in the back row. But at lunch, I went to lunch, everything by myself. I wasn't interested in talking to anybody. I was in utter pain that I was looking into the Catholic Church. I couldn't imagine being Catholic or ever believe it, but I had to look in, otherwise I'd be turning from God. Right. So I went to lunch in their school cafeteria, long tables. I came a little late. So there was a table and I stepped over the bench to fill that little spot and everybody left because I was late. They all finished their lunch, but there was only one young lady across from me. And when they all left, she said, hi, my name is so-and-so and who are you? And I thought, no, I don't want to talk. I don't want to, <laughs> but I have to be polite. And so we exchanged a few sentences and then she looked at me and she said, oh. I said, what's happened? What's the matter? She said, I just saw you sitting there in a nun's habit. I said, no. what do you mean? What do you mean? She said, I'm telling you, I just saw you in a nun's habit. And I said, well, I'm not even Catholic. She said, Doesn't I just it? saw you in a nun's habit. Isn't that amazing? I get chills thinking about it. But tons of things like that happened. How soon it after? Took a long time. No, no, how soon after you I became said, a nun did you remember that? Um, well, I, I guess I've, I've forgot it for several years, but there's so many stories that I've remembered. I could tell you, but it, it take up the whole program. Well, if I you won't think of that, another, but... tell another. I love stories. Jesus was a storyteller. You want another? I would love another. Okay. How about three? Because was... we'll do a total of three because that's what Jesus does. Serious? Okay. Um, this is my favorite. I was speaking at the Call to Holiness conference with uh, 4,500 people and nine speakers. Carl Keating, president of Catholic Answers, was with me. We flew down to Orlando to speak. I was giving two talks, Saturday and one on Sunday. I was giving the second talk on Sunday and I needed to leave. I was gonna be downstairs at the vendor's Catholic Answers table for a half hour and then I had to leave for the plane. Then I told the people that. Um, so I was downstairs and there was a line of people coming to say hello. And then there was a mother, you could tell she's homeschooling. She was in a jumper with a little white t-shirt and a carriage, a little baby and a six-year-old. And she had two in between that at home, I found out. So she came to me and the six-year-old looked at me and he said, where's your jacket? I had been wearing a turquoise suit and I had a flowered blouse on inside with a round collar and sleeves halfway down my arm. Mm -hmm. And it was so warm, I took the jacket off. And so I said to him, oh, I took it off, it's on the chair. Is this okay? I'm asking a six-year-old if my blouse is modest enough. He said, oh yes, I was just wondering. I said, what's your name? And I sat down and he was standing up in front of me with exactly eye contact, the same level. I said, what's your name? He said, John Paul. I said, good name, John Paul. What do you wanna be when you grow up? He said, I want to be a construction worker and a trappist. Can you imagine? And we exchanged a few more sentences. And he looked straight into my eyes. And he said, why aren't you a nun? This is a six-year-old. Out of the blue. And do you know the story, Christine, of St. Augustine on the beach with a five-year-old? I'm going to tell that. Is this some the people shells? Go ahead. I don't yeah. well, it's the, the water. It's the, it's the water, pill. right? Okay, go ahead. That's right. Let me tell it because so many people don't know it. I'll screw when it up. He said to me, yes, when he said to me, why aren't you a nun? Everything in me longed to be one, but I'm not the type. God wouldn't want me. I knew that. 
why would I be? He wouldn't want me to be a nun. I'm not the type. I ran two companies in New York. I'm a businesswoman and this or that. I'm not the type. God wouldn't want me. That's my thought. But when he said, why aren't you a nun? My heart physically left in my body. It physically left. I thought it would come out my throat. And I thought of St. Augustine on the beach with the five-year-old. And for those who don't know the story, St. Augustine was walking back and forth on the beach trying to figure out the Blessed Trinity. And he came across a five-year-old little boy who dug a big hole in the sand. And he had a little water pail. And he kept going over to the ocean, filling the pail and putting it in the hole. Filling the pail and putting the water in the hole. St. Augustine walks up to him and says, son, uh, what are you doing? A little boy says, oh, I'm putting the ocean in the hole. And St. Augustine said, <laughs> it's impossible for you to put that ocean in this hole. And the little five-year-old looked up at him and said, yes, I know. And it's just as impossible for you to figure out the Blessed Trinity. Now, that little five-year-old was a plant from God. There's no question. He was an angel. Right. Right. Well, the six-year-old in front of me was a real boy, not an angel. But know that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And so I said to him... I almost couldn't breathe. I sa he said, why aren't you a nun? Just like that, why aren't you a nun? And I said, I don't know, John Paul, do you think I should be one? And he said, yes. And I said, do you have a nun teaching you? He said, no, my mom homeschools us. My mom teaches us. And I thought, I had 30 seconds to leave for the plane. I said, John Paul, why should I be a nun? He said, because nuns are good and teach children. That's when I said, do you have a nun teaching you? He said, no, my mom teaches us. And I said, I, I have to, what am I going to do? I took this six-year-old on as my consultant. I said, John Paul, how will I know if God wants me to be a nun? And he looked at me and he said, ask him. Just like that, little six-year-old. So I left and I went up in the plane back to California. And I said, all the clouds, waiting for the Blessed Mother to appear to me. And I said, okay, dear Lord, John Paul said I should ask and I'm asking, but no answer. So many situations like that, so many stories. And, and I, here I am, I, I could never yeah. imagine. And I, I went to look at, see if I should enter a number of orders. Every superior said to me, we think you need to be a nun or a sister, whatever it is, but you're too old for us or we don't have your charism or whatever it is. And I met Father Groeschel, Father Pacwa, and they said, you need to start something. So I did. Wait, so you couldn't find one of joints. So you started your own for that reason? That's why. Because I, there were other, there were, because I want families to be restored. And there were beautiful, there are beautiful orders that help families. But we want them to know and live the faith. And a family could attend a, a conference or they could attend teaching and they know it. But then they go back home to reality. Right. And how do you live it two days later or when your spouse is not on board with you or when or this or that? We want to not just teach the faith, but walk them through it. We want to help families to live it. And that how, takes content. Daily it does. Content. So how do you do that? Yeah. I'm jumping ahead. I really want to get to your testimony as a Jewish girl, but we're right here. So let's do this. How do you do oh, wow. that? Oh, wow. How, how do you? Well, we do give conferences and we do have families come. I've had um, I've had families call me from Israel, from Germany, from all over and from locally. They come to our convent, they counsel and they bring their children and we teach them here or we'll go to their house. Now we'll have a venue to be able to have once a month good Catholic films and be able to talk about the faith. And then once a month, we're thinking for a second night, uh, everything you wanted to know about why be Catholic and we're afraid to ask. So Catholics don't know their faith. I came into the church three generations lost to the faith. And so Mother Miriam Live is a way for me to begin to put my arms around the world. And I've been on the radio since uh, 1999, actually. So that's an, a great venue. And, um, and I want to simply teach through the faith. And we do that, again, through groups, through little conferences, people coming to us are going to them. Uh, and 
I've thought often that we will grow in our charism according to the women God brings us. I want to teach little girls how to bake and sew and, and men to be the, the prayer. The, another thing we've done, we have a triptych of Our Lady. Our Lady of Guadalupe is the lady of our community. We have a triptych with Our Lady of Guadalupe in wood frame and the rosary on one side and prayers on the other. We bring her into a home and we help them set up a prayer table where the family goes every day. Put the triptych on there or a holy picture of the holy family or a statue of Our Lady, whatever it is, on the table with two uh, candles in lamps in glass so the children don't tip over a candle. And we'll put flowers. And then we bring them a bowl and a bag of about 50 beads. And the beads are so multicolored or all clear, nobody can tell whose bead is what. We put the little bag behind the triptych and we put the bowl in front of Our Lady. And we tell the family and the children, every time you do something good for God, every time, maybe you help somebody in school, maybe you don't beat up your baby sister, maybe you help the, with the dishes without your mom asking or without her asking a second time. Everything you do good, you go to the bowl, you go to the bag, you take a bead, you put it in the bowl, and you give it to Our Lady who gives it to Jesus. But you can't tell anybody, because if you do, it doesn't count. It's between you and God that you've done this good be deed. We go back to the families once every month. The bag is always empty. And the parents say to me, could we do that too? Could we put beads in too? I've had families complete, and they have to come together every night and pray the rosary, every night. And the father has to lead. And I give them a little book of teaching that the father will teach the family. And they have to do it every night and bless their children before they go out of the house every morning. Just little by little, that one prayer table has transformed so many families and other families. We wanted, can you come to our house? We, we can only do so much at one time. Yeah. And people have said, well, how do you get the families? We don't have time to get them. They come to us. They find out about it. So it, it's utterly transformative. It's fantastic. And at one family, I gave the father, they had four little girls and the mother was carrying the baby and they were all under six. And I gave them the prayer book and uh, the husband said, oh no, give it to my wife. She's better at it. I said, I know she's better at it. I don't know what God had in mind, but he gave the job to you. So he starts praying and the children, and the wife is trying not to giggle. And the children are so enamored with their dad leading them. The little girls are hugging and hanging on their father's leg now because he's leading them. And he's blushing red, embarrassed. But it continued and they're transformed. It's fantastic. And a man likes being a man yes. and being the head of the yes. family. He just needs help to do it. And the wife needs to not be so controlling. So we I help. Oh my gosh, there's so many things I want to say. This should be a three hour show. But, you know, I recently did a small video short that said the problem with men don't know how to lead because women don't know how to follow. And Satan has done a good job at screwing us both up. And so we women need to take the lead and letting our husbands lead and kind of backing off on that and letting them know that right. we think you are worthy. You can do it. Um, but it's it's quite the battle. And what a beautiful way to do it. It's the battle, Christine. How much time do we have? Plenty. Um, um, really? Yeah, let's say we got 40 minutes. Oh, really? Oh, we can, we can go okay, as let's... long as that is what I'm saying, as long as you need. Okay, this is great. Okay, so let me just give this, because it helps men and women understand where this controlling nature and other things come from. Genesis chapter 3, as a result of the fall, one of the... Uh, um, punishments of the fall, one of the detriments of the fall is that the wife would, in Genesis 3, I, I could look it up, but it's all right. The wife would desire her husband. Remember that? Mm -hmm. um, I could look it up, but the wife. I can look it up while you're talking. Would Go ahead. Genesis 3, 15 and following. It's the, it's the curse that God put on them, um, that the wife would build chain, she'll uh, bear pain and childbirth, and her desire will be for her husband. That's what it is. Her desire will be for her husband. 
I don't know what translation scripture you have. I have um, the just, NAS. Just rather the uh, putting it on RS Google one. here, but I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. They will strike at your head while you oh. strike at their heel. That's 315. Go ahead um, to 16. Um, the woman will have pain in childbirth and her desire will be for her husband. Let's put Genesis 3. How's that? 316. 316. Anyway, I know that's what it is. Okay. I know that's what it is. The punishment affects a woman directly by, oh, that's not it. All right. Well, I'll let you keep talking and then I'll find it. But okay. I'm, All Google's right. not as, as Catholic friendly quickly as it should be. Well, we, Bible Gateway is perfect. Oh, let but, me find um, Okay. I could do that too. I could do that too. Just Bible Gateway. Um, so I usually type in USCCB, but I didn't do that this time. Well, I use the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. So let me um, put that one up because it's one of the best. Um, not the new Revised, but the Revised Standard Version CE Catholic so, Edition. Let's see. Oh, that's chapter 16. Got it. Genesis 3. 316, to the woman, he said, I will intensify your toil and childbearing and pain. You shall bring forth children, yet your urge shall be for your husband and he shall okay, rule that's exactly over what I'm you. Looking at. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking at now. Hold on, because I hope I didn't lose you. Hold on. Oh, dear, Jean, oh dear. Um, While you're looking, can you still mother see me? I can still see you. Number 17, chapter verse 17, right after your wife shall have that urge for her husband, yet he shall rule over her. To the man, he said, because you listened to your okay, wife you and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground. So it's right. saying, and not that a man shouldn't listen to his wife, but I just realized by reading that, it is saying, of course, listen to your wife, but you should not take orders from her. You should not do what she tells you per se. Um, well, here's, here's the bigger point. Here's the bigger point, Christine. The words that say urge, your urge shall be for your husband. It is also translated desire. It's just pretty much sure. the same thing. You urge, you desire. And I read that and I said, how can that be a curse? For a woman's urge to be for her husband, her desire to be for her husband. That's a blessing. That's not a curse. Why is it part of the curse? Right? Why? That's part of the curse. Pain in childbirth and her desire will be for her husband. That's not a curse. But in the next chapter, we don't have to look this up. I, I know what it is. Chapter four. When Cain killed Abel and then God is punishing him. And Cain says in chapter four, it's too big. I and mean, he killed his brother. And he said, Lord, what are you giving me? I'm going to wear the sign of Cain. And it's too much punishment for me. How could it be too much? He killed his brother. And our Lord said to him, be careful because sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. Okay. Sin's desire for us is to control us. A woman's desire for her husband, it's the exact same word in both places. And if I remember the only two places in all of scripture that that word is used, it means a woman's desire it's will to be control. to control her husband. Oh. That's what it means. That's why it's the curse. It's the reverse of God's design. That's why it's a curse. Because normally a desire for your husband is what you want. Right. But this is the same as sin's desire to have you, to control you. And so we are, all of us, filled with concupiscence and our desire. It, it is part of the fall. And the enemy uh, camps on our weaknesses. So women say, but how do I, my husband, she controls everything. And my husband just stays back. He does, because he's not going to fight that. He's not going to know what he's made of. We're, We're in a feminist-dominated world that tells him if he does it that he's a bad and horrible person and he's toxic masculinity. Men don't know how to be men anymore because the world is stripped of it. And we women have allowed it because it's what we were taught. We have. Too. We have. We have. And so um, how do men take up their role? Um, 
by women being who not teaching their husband, not enabling their husband, not doing anything, just being who they are meant to be. Soft, lovely, um, help meets. Right. To keep a beautiful home, to love their husband, to respect him. Again, we may not respect him for the things he does or fails to do at times, but we respect what God has given him. He is the headship. He is the priest of the home. We may not respect certain priests and cardinals and bishops because of what they do or fail to do, but we must respect the office just as we do of the Pope. We must respect the office. Women must respect the role that their husbands have from God. They must respect that. And they must, men love to be needed. They love to be heroes because God made them that way. They're protectors and they're wonderful. But as long as women come in the way, they won't take up their role. So women stay back. Yeah, but if I stay back, the garbage won't be taken out. If I don't tell him, don't tell him, leave it alone. Let him step up to the plate. And if he never does, take it out and keep quiet about it. Don't tell him what to do. Be the most loving wife in the world. Let him know that he's needed and respected and you're not all sufficient without him. You don't run the house. You need him to run the house. You need him to pray the rosary. Honey, would you join us in the rosary? Uh, no, baby, you go. You're better at it than I am. But we need you. We need you. Papa, we need you. Send the children. Daddy, we need you. We need you to pray the rosary. Let him live up to his plate. And he would. God let him make him. the mistakes. You know how many women I talk to? So I, I, I coach clients and they'll come to me. And so many women say, I need my husband to be the leader. He's not leading this family. And within the next sentence or two, it's usually, and you know, I, when he, he doesn't do things my way. Okay, so you want him to lead, but you want him to do things your way. So then who's leading? Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. they, uh, you know, recently a woman, when I said that she caught herself like, oh, I'm like, you have to be willing to let him make a decision that you wouldn't make. And trust me, I'm an alpha female. It has taken me decades to start figuring this out. And I still mm -hmm. haven't fully figured it out. But I have learned some of the things that you're saying. My husband is super handy. He can do plumbing, electrical, flooring, tiles, roofs, whatever. And I, there yeah. are times where I've asked him to help me with something. And again, he's super busy. It's not like, anyway. And I have gotten frustrated with waiting for something to get done. So one of the tricks I've learned is I start doing it myself. I start peeling the wallpaper off the bathroom. And he's like, oh, you're not Good. doing it right. You're not right. And then so he'll come and start doing it. And one of the things he said a couple months ago was like, you know, every time you start something, you just do that because you know you're going to get me to do it. I'm like, well, well, how funny. Don't have to. It's your <laughs> choice. But he doesn't like yeah. to watch me do it. But, but you're right. We, and you know, I'm not begrudging the women and I'm not begrudging the men, mother, because again, we've all been screwed up. Satan has gotten in all of our heads. Women control them, control them. They don't let them put you down. Men, you know, be, be more effeminate, be more, sh shut up and don't tell her what to do. Or you're be toxic. What was that? No woman, no woman will ever be at peace unless she takes her role yeah. as a woman as a mother, as a helpmate, not as a director. Yeah. Because other than that, you're going to spend your life being frustrated because you can't make another person be what you want it to be. If we, how do I change my husband? Just by being the best, most holy, most loving mother and wife you could possibly be, leave him to God. That's it. And he'll change. There's a line That's out it. of my big fat Greek wedding that I use a lot. Have you ever seen that movie? Which one? My big fat my, Oh, Greek yes, the fat Greek. I love that movie. Love that movie. So when Tula goes into the coffee shop and she wants to go to college and she asks her mom, can I go to college? She says, we need to ask your dad. She's like, why does dad get to be the head of the family? And the mother said, Tula, Tula, the man is the head, but the woman is the neck. And it was funny, but it was oh. so true. <laughs> yeah. If you are mm -hmm. a good neck, you can turn the head. And, you know, yeah. I you know, I probably shouldn't say this to a holy woman, but my husband and I often joke and call it the cleavage factor, right? Yes, you know, Eve held the apple. Adam, you want to bite an apple? You know, so we joke about 
God gave women, you know, this beauty and this tenderness and, and men are entranced by beauty. And of course it shouldn't be used improperly, but this is kind of this balance that God put together. Use your beauty, not just your balance. physical beauty, it but just, in, yeah, use your internal beauty, use your spiritual beauty, use what God That's gave right. you and, and lead him to the decision that you want him to make. But if he doesn't make the decision you want him to make, and he makes a different decision. He's the head. You go with the decision he made. That's right. Unless it's that's right. That's right. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. But in a loving way, not manipulative. Correct. Correct. That's why the yeah. man is the head, but the woman is the neck. How can you turn him? Many men don't see what we see. So I've started, you know, instead of bossing my husband around, I've started saying, well, you know, here's what I was thinking. You know, if this happened and that happened here, just some of the pros and cons, and blah 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 blah, that's and perfect. then I got to leave it. You know, and then give him that's, time that's to think. Absolutely it. perfect. Yeah, it's yeah. perfect, Christine. Yeah, yeah. What do you we, do, we mother? To... What? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go, go. What do you do when you get a couple that comes in? Because you're into the restoring families business as well, where the husband wants to leave the wife, or the wife wants to leave the husband, or you're getting a single family. Do you get those as well? Going, we we don't, because that's what I do. I try to help people reconcile their marriages. What? How do you work with that? That's right. Well. Um, Two different, of course, a single parent is another story, but where a couple want to break up, I ask them why they get married in the first place, how they met, how they fell in love, what they loved about each other, mm -hmm. what has changed, do they want this to not work out, all of that, because nothing's impossible with God. Nothing's impossible with God. When people get divorced, it's because they want what they want. They want what they want. There's a wonderful book uh, titled Why I Became a Priest. And you know about Elizabeth Lesseur? She was a very faithful, strong Catholic. And her husband, an atheist. And there are things he didn't allow her to do. She couldn't leave Catholic things all over the house and all that. And she obeyed him in everything. And she kept a diary. And she lived her faith so lovingly and fully. When she died... He found her diary and he read it through and he not only became Catholic, but he became a priest because she lived her faith perfectly, true to what she believed, submitted to him, not didn't submit to violence, but submitted to him, loved him, uh, prayed for him, left him in God's hands. And, and I, I tell both of them, if, if, if they would be what God has called them to be, it's almost too good to be true what God has called them to be individually. It's too good for, to be true what God has called us to be. If we lived our vocation, we would know heaven on earth. And so, well, yeah, but then what do I do when he does this or doesn't do this or when she does this? No, leave it with God and pray and love. We love because he first loved us. Love is is the answer it's the key to everything acceptance people need to be accepted you know i think why did john paul ii capture the world's youth he knew what they were you know they walked by with earrings and tattoos and drums and and he beat his hand with them to the drums and loved them but he didn't deal with them based on what they were not dismissing what and who they are but based on what they are called to be and what he believed they would be. And that's how he dealt with them on what they are becoming. And he, they wouldn't let him down. People that encourage me most, we all want to be approved. We all want to be liked. We want to be okay. The people who encourage me most are those that deal with me on the basis of what I wish I were what I'm becoming. I don't fool myself to think they can't see what I am with my faults and everything, but they deal with me based on what I want to be. And I don't want to let them down or myself down. It's the greatest encouragement in the world. So if a husband loves his wife, not based on who, what she does or doesn't do, he loves her or wife loves her husband and she says, sweetheart, maybe he's not a believer. And she'd say to him, if you become Catholic, I won't love you anymore 
than I do now. And if you don't become Catholic, I won't love you any less. It's not based on your being Catholic. Sweetheart, if you don't become the most, what I think, or the world thinks, or what you think is the most perfect wife and woman in the world, I won't love you less. And if you become the model of models and the loving you become Mary's duplicate, I won't love you more. You are the woman God gave me. And because what affects me negatively shows me more about myself than you. Because look what we do before God. We sin. And it affects him. If someone, how do I say this? If Christine, you said to me, mother, you're a cheapskate or something. It wouldn't affect me because I know I'm not. This doesn't matter. You think that doesn't matter to me. I know I have led you to believe that or you have something to believe that. I don't know what it is, but it's not my problem. The problem is that you feel that or think that, and I may want to help you with it. If it's true, then I want to do something about it. We are sorely affected by people's opinions of us and and words, they hurt us deeply because there's truth in them. If it wasn't true, if someone looked at me and said, you're Chinese, I said, what are you talking about? I, I'm not Chinese. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't hurt me. It has nothing to do with me. But if someone says, mother, you're not, you were wrong in this, you weren't wise in this, but Lord, I need to look at that. I want to be a saint. I want to be, I want to grow in holiness. Thank you. So a husband and wife's first vocation is to get each other to heaven yes. before the children. Yes. And so one man said to me, my wife is driving me up the wall. I said, she's living her vocation to make you a saint. <laughs> That's right. That is the truth. Because it's not our actions that show us what we are and where we are, it's our reactions. Our actions we control, but our reactions we can control. And that's a mirror on our soul. So if we wanna be saints, we get there through suffering. And I tell my sisters, I could be the best superior in the world, but if I am, it's not gonna help them. Only if I have things that rub them the wrong way and they have to say, I know more than mother does on that. And why do I have to follow her? Because God is interested in making us saints in how we react when things are said that's not true about us or when someone sees into us and we don't want them to. It's our reaction. So they always show me where I'm at. And if a husband and wife who want a divorce truly want to be saints and watch how God can transform them and have the marriage they've always dreamt about they need to trust that God brought them together, each one the other, iron sharpens iron, to help each other become saints. There's so much we could say, but- So much. It, 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 yeah. I've learned the value of obedience in the past three, four, five years since the summer of shame and everything. And, and I pay attention and bishops, and priests having to obey bishops and bishops having to obey people, you know, and husbands, wives having to obey their husbands. and. You know, I've really started studying how obedience is so precious to God, not that he's going to blame him. For instance, I have a spiritual director and he is a deacon and he says, I only like to take two directees at a time because I will be culpable for everything I tell you. Um, and so I had a decision um, that was tough before. And he said, you know, what do you think this, that, blah, blah, blah. And I ultimately went with a decision and he's like, well, I didn't think you'd go with that, but Okay. But he said, but there will be times where I will tell you, you do this or you do that. And as your spiritual director, you know, I'm because you brought me on. Uh, there are things that I'm going to want you to obey or I'm not going to stay directing you just as a husband would have to do that with a wife. So I've started realizing God is saying, OK, he, he said, if he makes a mistake in telling me to do something that God wouldn't have me do, the, the fault falls on him and not me. 
assuming it's not a sin, right? Assuming he's not telling me to kill yeah, somebody and I kill somebody. Everything but sin, 100%. Right. So if he's telling me something that's not sinful overtly and then I obey him, it ends up being wrong, then God is going to deal with him. And that's why obedience is God's way of teaching us. He, ultimately, I want you to obey me. I want you to see your faithfulness. You, you know what, what I'm saying? Same thing with children and parents. But my mom is wrong. Yeah, maybe she's wrong. Maybe you're right. Maybe she's wrong. But if you disobey her, even though she's right, you're wrong before God. Because you're breaking because God was right. That's it. When I first went, this is a huge lesson in my life. When I first went my, to my novitiate, that first canonical year, I've been on my own since I'm 17. No one's going to control me. I'm a controller, all of that. And I went to my novitiate and I said to them, it's obedience. I've never been under obedience. No one's telling me what to do. And I said to them three things. Number one, um, I don't like people. That was my first thing. <laughs> well, I, I'm with thousands of people, but I don't want to live with them. That was my first thing. Secondly, allergic to obedience. And thirdly, because they were completely silent and cloistered, I said it doesn't occur. You broke up for it number two and number three. What, what was it about obedience All you right. said? The second thing I said to them is, I am allergic to obedience. Oh, allergic. <laughs> and the third thing, because they are a totally silent and cloistered where I went, we're not, but they are. I said, it doesn't occur to me not to talk. <laughs> well, to my shock, I mean, I love them. When I left them, they said, we want your daughters to be our nieces where we love each other. Aww. But on the, and as far as not talking, it took me about three quarters of the year to get it. <laughs> but the obedience I got in two months, I was shocked because the novice mistress I had uh, and other things. And I said, oh no, 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 no. And I got it. It doesn't matter. It's not my judgment. If I think she's wrong, I could offer a thought. If it helps her, that's fine. But she's, no, I want this. End of story. Again, as you say, as long as it's not sin. I've never known such freedom. It's the freedom of obedience. Because it, God doesn't want us to do what's right. He wants us to be holy and do what is right concerning not sinning. But he's more interested in our formation and that we could submit and we could say yes lord our lady's fiat how could how could she say yes a 15 year old jewish maiden who was born under the law who knew that god was one the god of abraham and now the angel's telling her she's going to bear the son of god jews knew you couldn't look on god and live you couldn't touch God and live. Uzzah touched the ark and he was struck dead. You can't. How can I bear the son of God? A billion questions. It's I an impossibility. Yeah. It's an impossibility. And she said, Fiat, let it be done to me according to your will. But I trust him. We're the, we're the pot. He's the potter. So if we trust the people God has over us, we are free. We are and we'll always be right, even if our superiors, even if our husband is wrong, again, barring sin, even if our parent is wrong. The issue is obedience. The issue is obedience, always. And it's the freest thing in the world, which is why God has established authority in everything. Yeah. That's it. And of the family man, man as well. Woman, woman over children. Yeah. Wow. Well, I have so much to ask. Well, father over children as well, but yes, a mother has authority over her children where she doesn't have authority over her husband, but yes. Absolutely not. And if it comes to authority over her children and the husband disagrees, he is the head. What if uh, she the wanted to take the children to church and he says, I don't want the kids going to church? Because he's not a believer or something like that? Sometimes. Well, I've had that. Should the mom let the yeah. kids stay at home? 
because she'd be obeying her husband, but breaking her heart because she thinks a lot. I've had this oh, with see, clients this, as this, well. As well, it's very, very difficult because that's why I want to help restore God's design for the family. The issue is the marriage to begin with. Right. Because if they're married in the church, they have vowed to raise, raise their the children, children Catholic, in the faith. It's Catholic or not. They vowed for that. And so if they vowed that and been properly married in the church and the husband has agreed to raise the children Catholic um, and he doesn't want her taking the children to church, she needs to say, sweetheart, you're breaking your vow to God. You're abusing us in a lovely voice and you're breaking your vow to God, but I can't. I have vowed to raise the children Catholic and we will go to church. And we'd love you to join us. There are times because it would be sin not to. I was just going to say, there because I, yeah, I keep holy the Lord's days of commandments. So if the mother was oh, complicit in go. that sin, right. You need to go. Now, again, if he agreed to wait, raise the children Catholic, it's a vow to God and a vow to one another and a vow to God. And I, I, I would lovingly say to him, honey, um, I'm so sorry for the trouble you're having and the problems you're having and your lack of faith. I'm so sorry. I'll do anything I can to help you, but I cannot break my vow to God. And we agree to raise the children in the faith and we will. I will take them to church. Now, if he's an abusive man, and he stops them from going in the car. There's nothing you can do about that. And it's not sin on your part. But if a man is abusive like that, you need to leave him. Yeah. Not divorce, but you need Correct. to leave him and go. Because you're married until death, just, whether you like it or not. But yes, get out of the house that, and get safe. And you need to be safe, right? You don't ever have to submit to abuse. Verbal abuse. I, I, sis, Mother, you've had these same conversations I have. I've had people fight me. Um, I can think of one very famous Catholic person who's on her second marriage, but the first was annulled. And she's very sensitive. No, you do not stay in if it's abusive. And I'm like, no, I, you don't stay in the house. But see, that was a situation she dealt with. So she feels convicted. And I'm like, you were in a valid marriage now. You you had, that was annulled and you're valid. So why is this so sensitive to you? But it's it's a tough one for people. But um, I have seven minutes um, to, to close out. And I really did want to jump in really quickly. You became a Catholic in 1990 and a sister in 1995. We got a whole bunch of Jewish time before that. Can you, in that time frame, what on earth? <laughs> How did you become yeah. Catholic? I, I became a Catholic in 95 and a sister in um, oh. in uh, 2008. So okay. a little change of dates. But I was born in uh, Brooklyn, Bum and Jewish. My mother, my father, my grandparents, Hungarian and Russian Jews. We were raised as conservative Jews. We waited every year for the Messiah to come. And um, there's so much involved here. But in our 30s, my brother was searching for truth. And he came across an article that said there's such a thing as Jews, Jewish people alive on the face of the earth who believe the Messiah came 2,000 years ago. And I said, my brother David, I said, David, you know, there's all kind of troubled people in the world. Jews are just as entitled to be troubled as everybody else. But you can't be Jewish and believe in Jesus. But you could be Jewish and be troubled. Anyway, a year and a half later, I moved out to California. I met these so-called Jews for Jesus, who led me over a year and a half through all the Old Testament scriptures to the Messiah. Um, oh, my. Seven minutes. Let me take two of them to tell you how. They said to me that we come into the world through original sin, separated from God. Jews believe that, but I've never understood the implications of that. And if we leave the world that way, we will be separated from him for all eternity. And when God gave the law to the Jewish people, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or forgiveness of sin. He had them bring a lamb, a perpetual offering, bulls, goats, lambs, but the lamb to an altar. And the lamb had to be like the Passover lamb without blemish, without spot, one year old and absolutely perfect to symbolize a perfect offering for a holy and perfect God. And the people would put, bring the lamb to the altar. I'm going to leave my hand up here. They put the hand, their hand on the head of the little lamb. Someone just gave me him, little lamb. Okay. So they come to the altar and they put their hand on the head of the little lamb. And it was symbolic of the sin passing from the individual 
on to the lamb and the little lamb who was innocent, but who had taken upon himself the sin of this person was slain and his blood shed on the altar as an offering to God for this person's sin. I listened to them, these Jews for Jesus. And I said, why? Why would God put an innocent animal to death for my sin? Put me to death. It made no sense. But it began to make sense to me. I began to understand that sin was no light issue to God. And they explained to me that millions of lambs through 1,500 years of the Mosaic sacrificial system and every Passover, every Jewish family had to slay a lamb and 4,000 feet up Jerusalem and the hills were drenched with the blood of lambs. And they said to me, millions of lambs through 4,000 years could not take away the sin of one single person, let alone the whole world, because they were dead, dead sacrifices. They were Yom Kippur, day of covering, holiest Jewish day of the year. We always would shul, synagogue, praying, the day of covering. God covered their sins, but they couldn't take them away. But they said to me that every lamb and all the lambs together couldn't take away sin, but were assigned to point to the one who would one day come and take upon himself, not the sin of a single person temporarily for a time, ineffectual, couldn't change the heart, couldn't do anything but the sin of everyone, man, woman, and child for all time, past, present, and future. Then they went to the New Testament. I didn't know they were in the New Testament. When John the Baptist was baptizing the nation of Israel in the Jordan, and Jesus came, and John looked at him and said, Behold, the Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christine, for a year and a half, they've been trying to tell me everything. Nothing got through. Like an old tattered curtain with little lights, little holes in the curtain. Every once in a while, a little shaft of light. When they said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I have chills now telling you. Someone pulled the curtain. It was as if. And exposed the stage. I knew it happened. I knew it was true. I thought, if one little uh, lamb under the old covenant could symbolically, ineffectually take upon himself the sin of a single individual, what then could the blood of God's son do? I don't know if you can see it, the cross behind me? I can, yes. The Lamb of God and our sins and the sins of the entire world transferred to him, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. My whole body shook. I couldn't stand, I couldn't speak, I couldn't believe what I was just beginning to hear. I was with them two weeks later. They were talking about his being alive. And I said, you told me he died. And they said, but he rose from the dead. And I said, why didn't anybody say so? Why didn't anybody say so? And I gave my life to him as an evangelical Protestant, John MacArthur was my pastor. I taught, I graduated Protestant seminary. I did everything to save the world. And then it was the summer of 1990. Listen to that trouble, listening to the troublemaker Scott Hahn that began my journey and I realized that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who no man could look on and live, became man through the virgin, took on flesh and blood for us. And it took me 18 years later to realize that our Lord is the triune God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he went a further step of condescension and became our food. I am as complete a Jew as a Jew could be. I'm a happy camper. And I get to wear this. I get, I'm going to tell you, I told LifeSite News, they interviewed me a few weeks ago, and I said, I've been asked to write a book by a couple of publishers that we know, but I'll never have time enough. I can't imagine. I'm not getting younger, having time enough, but I'm going to tell you what the title is, because I have the title. It's a hanger for God. That's all I am, is a hanger for God. I get to wear this habit. It has nothing to do with me. My body gets to wear this habit, and I'm assigned to God, all of us are wherever we are in the world. Little girl, six-year-old, look up. Jesus is mommy. People ask us for prayer, everything. We can't walk a block without people coming to us. Going through the nine years of Catholic Answers, I went through airports. I did 50 conferences a year. And I said, what a waste. But if only I was in a habit, I'd be assigned to God. Now, I can't go anywhere without being, I'm Christine, you know I could talk for five more hours. No, I would love it. I am a happy, I have a I'm a happy camper, and we have as Catholics, 
what the whole world needs and God help us if we keep it to ourselves. Wow. God is surely using you and he is surely, I, I, I haven't even got to ask you how you got to be a business owner and, you know, God gave you those skills or business runner, right? Whichever one. Yeah, runner, two companies. I ran them for the owners, marketing and publishing and uh, that's what a thing. perfect background or gifting to do what you're doing now to market and to right. get people right. to also be, you know, other hangers for God and then bring in the money oh, to these families. Yeah. Yep. 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 So, uh, well, I want to make one more please. So, what was yeah. that? I was going to say, how many minutes do we have left? Well, I have a commitment in nine minutes, but I may let it go, but we'll see. <laughs> so, no, no, no. That's, this is good. That's but good. we have, I want all of you, if you've heard mother Miriam's heart to think that she can help families, God through her, of course, she takes no credit for it. But if, if you will allow Mother Miriam to lead other women closer to God, to teach other women how to help restore families, there are all these exponential gifts, exponentially greater numbers of husbands that will return to love their wives and wives that will submit to their husbands and learn to respect them and children that will grow in the faith and be secure because their mommies and daddies aren't living in a separate house but they're living in the same house together yes they fight i have all these people say oh, my kids would rather me be a part uh, that the lie that the the feminist movement in the world has put out there that kids would rather you be apart and happy than together and fighting no they wouldn't they'd rather have you together and fighting let me Go break ahead. in just to give you a statement yes. that Archbishop Chapu has said. He said, the greatest gift a father can give his children is to love their mother. Yeah. And the reverse, the greatest gift a mother can give her children is to love their father. Yes. If you dote your children with gifts at all, it doesn't mean anything. But if they see you hugging and kissing in the kitchen and they see you loving each other, they not only learn love, it's just what you said, Christine, they feel secure. That is what will give them confidence. And even yeah. if you are, but I was also addressing those people who right now are like, we're, we're miserable. I, I don't want to be with this person. It is so much better for you to stay with that person, carry your cross. Again, we're not talking about you're being physically abused. Let's just put that aside. But apart yeah, from right. that, carry that cross and let your children see the goodness that comes from carrying a cross because too many people say this isn't marriage well actually it is sometimes to carry a cross because you're never going to marry a perfect person so every marriage has a I cross always, every one of them has a cross your spouse is your cross i always say why did god design marriage it's because there's no way to heaven except through suffering yes yes so we have to so if you off say i'd be happy if i'll be happy if my wife changed my husband changed then that'll never be happy. You'll never be happy. Your happiness has to come from God, from living your vocation with God. Let him take care of your spouse. Yes, yes. Well, Mother Miriam said at the beginning of the show that in three days time, she has to, or is hoping to have the remaining $150,000 of the 1.4 million that they needed yeah. for this convent, convent estate. Yeah, we have um, to close. Yeah, we close, they have to close Friday on Friday and she will not take out yeah. a loan. So the Lord is now touching somebody's heart. Please go to okay. mother of Israel's, right? Mother of Israel's.org. Uh, no, mother of Israel's hope. Mother of Israel's org. hope. Org. That didn't seem right. Yeah. Mother of Israel's mother hope. No hope, apostrophe. Uh, dot org. Mm -hmm. No apostrophe in the in the uh, URL, motherofisraelshope.org. You can donate directly from the donate button, uh, or you can get our address from the contact button and send us directly a gift. Um, if you want to wire something, uh, email us with the address there, and I'll give you that information. It's tax deductible. We're 501c3. Uh, if you need an EIN, a federal tax ID number, we'll give you that. You'll see the um, um, uh, our email on the contact button. You can ask me anything in the world. And if you want to know anything, learn, help your family about the daughters of Mary, mother of God, of Israel's hope. Daughters of Mary, mother of Israel's hope. That's the order that Mother Miriam is the founders of. 
if, I know mother, you're going to be like, oh, 50, I can't even get back. But if you are feeling called to this order, go to that website, contact Mother Miriam and the others. If God will lead you, he'll provide a way. And if you're a mother and you feel like this is where your daughter needs to be, consider contacting them as well. This may be the order that God's calling her to. So, um, so many things, Mother Miriam. Oh, and don't forget to listen to Mother Miriam on Mother Miriam Live. Every well, you can, podcast, you can find it every day. Every day, day right? every day, 10 to 11 Eastern time, Monday through Friday, 10 to 11 Eastern time, thestationofthecross.com, livesitenews.com, or Facebook Mother Miriam Live. And that way you can actually ask your questions live on air. Uh, so you know, every day I teach for the first, mm-hmm. yeah, I teach for the first half hour and then there's call in or emails questions for the second half hour every day. Yeah. But if you're like everybody else and you don't want to ask a question live and you just want to hear, you can hear it, you know, anytime you want, just pull up that podcast. So uh, you can go to LifeSite News and get that as well. I want to, for looking at the time, please share this show with your friends and family. They may be the ones that want to help, or they just may be the ones to, who knows, you have a Jewish friend that may, you know, become Catholic through this show. We don't know how God's going to use it, but forward this show, like my page, breakfastwithbacon.com, like me on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and and my my own website breakfastwithbacon.com obviously so i god has given me the ministry to save a million marriages before i die really save a million souls through marriage i would love for you to help me sisters got mother miriam's got the same uh a million restored similar. marriages yeah, yeah very similar yeah. so you know let's, let's get those uh-huh. numbers up <laughs> let's get those numbers yeah. up uh, I don't think there's anything else. Oh, I want to make sure to invite you to our conference in October. Ah. We are having Christine mm-hmm. Watkins, Daniel O'Connor, Doug Barry, yeah. Alexis Walkenstein uh, coming to the Disrupting the Culture with Truth conference uh, our, in 2023. It's our second annual at the Virginia Beach Convention Center. If you want to buy your tickets, go to truthspeakers.org. If you forget that, you can go to my website, which is breakfastwithbacon.com, and there's a link where you can click on it. And if you want to know what we talk about, go and click and purchase last year's videos for just $20, and you'll be amazed at these awesome speakers God has brought to us. Everyone's got a mission. God just wants to fill heaven, and we want to do our part in helping him to do so. So that's my mouthful to try and get as much in as I can. All right. Mother Miriam, I think you might remember what I said. Say it again. I think you might remember how I close my shows. Oh, yes, I do. I I want to ask you. Yes, say it. And then I have to ask you one more question. I was going to say it's the first time you've had a Jew on breakfast with bacon. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I'm eating bacon. I never ate it growing up, but I'm eating it now and I love it. Actually, I have a uh, Messianic Jew was my voice teacher. And she was a Jew playing piano in a Presbyterian church. And she said, I did what every good little Jewish girl did while they they were saying the homily. She said, I read a book. And then one day she was hit by a bolt of lightning in church and knew instantly that God is God. And she became a a Christian immediately. She's still not Catholic, but we'll get her. But actually she, so you're the second Jew that I know that's on the show. Beautiful. So it is God's stories are so amazing that he writes. So I did have one more question. I was going to ask you one more question. It's a fill in the blank. Name one thing you would have our listeners do differently as a result of something they heard today. Hold back nothing from God. Your whole life will be loved from now on, no matter what. You no longer respond to negativity with negativity only with love as God responds to us and forgive as God in Christ has forgiven us. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Uh, So much more I'd like to say. If you'd like to see Mother Miriam again, let me know. Put your comments here. Just below, I will have a link below the show with the motherofisraelshope.org so you can actually just click on there. And um, anyway, I do have to take us off the air. And I want to say God bless you to each and every one of you. I am... Dr. Christine Bacon, and you have been watching Breakfast with Bacon. 